This episode of Downstream is brought to you by BAE Systems, Shell, and our pals at Skynet. I too welcome our robot overlords. Just joking. We're on the air because of viewers like you. Thank you. Here's something I've been thinking for a while. A lot of the political dysfunction we've seen over the past decade, from Brexit to Boris Johnson to runaway inequality, is basically the result of a chronic dysfunction in the media. We get bad politicians because their reputations are buffed and ballooned by pundits and hacks, and we lose good ones because political journalists decide to drum them out of public life. UK political media operates on a herd mentality. When something gets identified as a story, everyone charges after it until something dramatic happens. The Daily Mail, the Westminster Lobby, the Today Programme all stampede in the same direction for a while, and it's the stuff that they choose to notice and pursue that we call news. But all the other stuff, the big questions like why living standards have gone into reverse, just gets ignored. What gets covered and what doesn't is determined by the law of political expediency. It was expedient to pretend that Jeremy Corbyn was the devil, Liz Truss a serious politician, and that there was no alternative to austerity. Then, when those pretenses can no longer hold, the herd just moves on to some new ones. Nothing ever really changes. That's not a glitch, it's a feature. Media in the UK is designed to allow the rich and powerful to hoard extreme levels of wealth and status at the expense of ordinary people. It's not meant to inform us. It doesn't want to share the truth. It exists to protect the interests of an elite few. So today I'm joined by my brilliant, intrepid, beautiful colleagues, Moya Lothian-McLean and Michael Walker, to talk about exactly what bad media does to our politics and what's wrong with it at its core in the first place. So here's a funny thing. I've never actually asked either of you how you got into media and why. Who would like to start? I think you probably have, and I've probably told you, but it's fine to forget things sometimes. <laughs> I drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is also appalling. Uh, how did I get into media? Kind of by accident, in a way. Um, I always thought of myself more as like a political activist who went into media. Yeah, I've done a full circle. <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I need to hear this yeah, story. Yeah, you you did the Pikachu <laughs> being <paper. laughs> like, Whoa. Uh, So I was, well, I was like a, a political activist in my youth. Um, what were you anarchist, acting on? Squatter, climate Chartist. activist. Sorry. I uh, got arrested in community service for stopping a plane taking off. Michael oh, Walker's credentials. Yeah, that was uh, when I was 20. So 13 years ago or something like that. Maybe 18, I'm not sure. Which plane? You uh, weren't one of the Stansted. It was, it was the Stansted <laughs> one. It was like against airport expansion and they didn't expand it. So you weren't the Stansted 15, you were Stansted. I don't know, Stansted, whatever number it was. <laughs> um, that, I think there were more than 15 of us. Um, but anyway, I sort of fell out with that kind of politics, as you might have guessed. Well, I have a deep respect for that kind of politics, but it's not really me. Um, in, the, in sort of the student movement, I was very much also like a kind of black block anarchist. Um, and, but then sort of like, yeah, I sort of like, well, what was that all about? You know, it's a, it a bit isolated, a little bit. I think I got a bit frustrated that I felt people were a bit disparaging of like normies, of people outside of that movement who weren't as radical as them. So basically, I thought I'm I'm gonna not do politics. I was gonna tr for a while. I was gonna train as a mental health nurse, and then I went and worked in a school. So I was a teaching assistant in a school in Peckham for a while. Um, but the problem with that was I had to wake up too early. <laughs> <laughs> like I really loved it. I loved all my colleagues. The anarchist wake up. I love the kids, but I was just tired all the time. So I whenever whenever teacher strikes come up on the on the show, like my comment at the end is always like, "Teachers, so much respect for you." <laughs> I tried to do that. I couldn't. Because <laughs> you have to wake up really early and then you have to be really on the ball for like five hours in a row. You know, I have, peaks, Navarro? And, I have peaks and troughs here. My whole day is leading up to 7 p.m. where I have to be on it for an hour and then I can relax again. Um, I do work quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where were we? Anyway, so I work because, for- Because you know, like the fundraising ask is, um, give us one hour of your wage a month so we can work around the clock. And you're like, look, I do one hour a day and I don't <laughs> like early starts and I'm mediocre outside of the hours of six till seven. 
<laughs> yeah, kind of. Well, I, no, I write a good I write a good script from about 10 a.m. So that's a long day, but I can do the peaks and troughs as I please, right? As a teacher, you have to be on for this hour and you also have to be very consistent. You know, so you can't, what, my problem with, with working in a school was always like, sometimes I'd be a little bit strict and then sometimes I'd be like, Oh, no, you, you can't like, do that. You know, like, do let's that. just be reasonable. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Then we can read this poem by Tupac that I prepared for us all to do. <laughs> and they'd be like, you are going to get destroyed. <laughs> but, like kids can really smell weakness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really I, was, smell I was exuding it, you know. <laughs> um, so then I moved to Spain. And this is the period of time when Podemos are getting big, Syria's are getting big. And I really love this because it's, it's a left-wing project that's majoritarian. So it's like trying to speak to as many people as possible. And I respect that, you know, I really want to be speaking to as many people as possible, which is something that I felt was lacking from the kind of politics I was doing before. And I used to learn Spanish from their TV program, which was called La Tuerca and Forta Pache. Um, I've forgotten Spanish now, but I, I, I think You can still, do an Italian accent, which is very impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so I got really into that show and I was just so impressed that they had this show where they talk about like populism and Gramsci and a sort of Chilean coup. And they'd have like 25,000 people watching it on YouTube. And I'd be like, I can't believe there are 25,000 people who watch this show about Gramsci. Like we have to make something like this happen in the UK. And I was gonna stay there another year, but then Corbyn got elected and I was like, I can be here and sort of like inarticulate because my Spanish still isn't very good because watching YouTube videos isn't enough. Um, or I can go back there and like have some agency. So I came back to the UK. Um, with some friends of mine, some very long-term friends of mine, we pitched The Fix, which was basically a direct copy of Fort Apache to Navarra um, and started making that. Um, and I was still very much doing this as an active, I've, I've never really wanted a job in the media. So this was like, as a, we want to make the left a popular hegemonic force. Um, and then just through various iterations, we ended up where we are now with Navarra Live. And I became, you know, full-time integrated into Navarra Media. And then now, yeah, I suppose the full circle bit is, I much prefer seeing my role now as more of a journalist than a political activist because I just, I prefer coming to stuff with, at this point in my life, with sort of like curiosity than I've got a line which I want to sell. Um, I respect people for whom that is their way of doing sort of like journalism, but I've sort of settled into a position where I much prefer sort of like curiosity. And I suppose that means I've really, um, it goes with the role of host, right? I've sort of embraced that role of host, which is I'm here to be a curious person who will try and make this all sort of like engaging and, and, and easy to understand. I think also for me, there has to be a degree of respect and humility for what activists actually do. Mm. So I'm forever on the BBC being introduced as an activist. And I go, don't call me that because I do fuck all, right? It's other people who are putting in the graft, doing the organizing, going canvassing, um, who are putting their bodies and sometimes their freedom on the line in order to achieve a particular political goal. And then I just go in the news and talk about it. I do the really, really easy bit of it. And I think that because media takes up so much more of our lives now, because so much of our experience of the world is mediated through screens, mm -hmm. there becomes this fantasy of going, well, any act of communications that I do is a form of activism. And it's not, I mean, one of the things I really like about this as an organization is that I think that we are curious about what activist groups do and how they function. I mean, one of my favorite pieces of content recently was something that was helmed by Claire Heimer, who hasn't been allowed to participate in this discussion because I locked her in the trunk of a car. Um, and it was about the organizational questions and strategic questions that the climate movement mm -hmm. are facing at the moment. So someone from Extinction Rebellion um, talking about the lack of urgency from other parts of the left, really addressing the question of what tactics are justifiable, which ones are justifiable, but not necessarily going to work really well, so on and so forth. And that's not a conversation that you hear anywhere else because the conversation about Just Stop Oil or Extinction Rebellion on LBC or the BBC is hanging, is it too good for them? Yes or no? Whereas we're able to go, okay, we're not activists. Like I'm not really endangering myself vis-a-vis -vis the state very often with my work, but these guys are, and let's take them seriously. But tell me about your villain origin story. My villain origin story, uh, it's almost the opposite to Michael's, I would say, which is quite interesting in that. Did you start Normie? I started so Normie. I was normally from the core. I got into journalism, I sort of wandered my way. I'd always been politically 
engaged. I grew up in a household where, you know, politics was sort of the fabric. I was raised by a single mother who was left leaning. She kind of came of age in the seventies, in her twenties and had gone all over the world and was very committed. I think my family was very committed to sort of values of acceptance, understanding and diversity of both opinion, but also types of people. We're a very large family. You tend to have a broader spectrum of people within that. And obviously I'm like uh, ethnically diverse as well. compared Full to- time. <laughs> Full time <laughs> compared to the rest of my like white family that I grew up with. Um, so when I went to university, I was quite switched on. Like I was engaged in stuff and I'd I wrote a blog at university about politics as well, which was, you know, very piecemeal, but I'd always had, I guess from a young age, questioned some of like the narratives that we were given. Like I, I was very anti sort of conservative. I, But I also wanted to look at like institutions. Like I remember writing a blog about when our our university wanted to change its name, like spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds and yet education, like contact hours were being slashed, the wages of workers were being slashed. And I didn't see this as a particularly sort of like insightful thing to do. But back now I'm like, wow, I was actually doing that at this age. Oh, how interesting. I was organically kind of coming towards it. Uh, but I started music journalism. So I wrote a music mm-hmm. blog and it was noticed. I've told the story so many times, but it was noticed through the medium of Twitter, which I would not have a career with without, by the head of music at Vice. And they told someone to get me in as a freelancer. And so I started writing for Vice as a freelance music journalist, which if you talk to, I think a lot of young brown people in who started in digital media vice is one of the main routes in so and then so i've started vice and i worked at gallery at some point you know there's a very interesting conversation there that i think we're about to have about digital media and the fate of digital media and then after university i somehow got a job at a women's lifestyle magazine which was purely geared towards what they call the abc one audience which is like affluent women in urban areas like London, Manchester. And that was very 2015 feminism. It was all sort of Girls Bakery women. It was, yeah, it was Girls Bakery. They are Girls Bakery women. And, but I learned so much there. Like I I don't want to knock this place. I was working on print and digital. Um, They gave me a huge load of opportunities that I wouldn't have had anywhere else. Uh, But it was when my politics, I started to realize that my politics were developing even, not even unconsciously, but developing into something perhaps more radical than these people who define themselves as feminists and, you know, progressives. And I was very much to the left of them and couldn't understand why they weren't on in the same sort of wavelength. And then obviously Corbyn came along. And I remember I wasn't, I wasn't that politically educated. I just had instincts and understanding. And I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't versed in sort of Marxism. And I probably, if you said something, are you a socialist? I would say, yeah, but I wouldn't be able to like outline exactly what that meant. It was, it was quite surface level and something that I'm still trying to actually dig into, which is my political education, because I came to it without a traditional political education. Um, Corbyn came along and I was like, okay, like a lot of young people my age, I was completely galvanized. I joined the party after Ed Miliband lost Labour Party because I felt so guilty that I hadn't done any canvassing and that I was supposedly speaking this cause. Now I put less stock in parliamentary politics, but it's interesting to see how back then I was like, okay, well, if you want to change things, you have to join this, you have to do that. And as I've got older, my views have perhaps altered on the mecha- mechanisms that will lead to long-term change. But yeah, so I joined the party. So I was able to vote Corbyn in the first and second time, I think. I didn't really know what Jeremy Corbyn stood for. I just thought he sounded really good. So I just voted for him. I remember I got to make out with a really hot guy at festival because, <laughs> because of Jeremy Corbyn. Because, you were like, and then because his name was Jeremy Corbyn. I think Corbyn. he won, I think it was the second time, the second election and we were, and he was like, oh, did you, did you vote, are you Labour? And I was like, yeah, I vote for Corbyn. He was like, I vote for Corbyn too. And I pulled simply because I'd voted for Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Jeremy. So thank you, Jeremy, for everything, but particularly that. Thank you so much. Um, And yeah, so from then it was, this is taking a long time, sorry. But from then it was, it was interesting. I kind of like, I left the Women's Lifestyle magazine. I went to the BBC and I thought that my path in journalism was going to be, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was, I was boxed into, you write about politics, but from sort of like, a fluffy lifestyle angle, like, you know, Ariana Grande said this amazing thing, or, you know, you're talking about why dating apps entrench racial racial preference. Girls do social issues. Girls do social issues a little bit. And I I didn't know, I didn't think I ever had the capability to write about politics in a really serious way. Um, I still often don't. And I don't like the word imposter syndrome, but I, I think there's something there about, you know, I didn't have the traditional background in journalism. I didn't have the traditional background in politics. I had neither of those things. Um, so I learned so much from my colleagues at Navarra Media, especially in the people I've worked with. But yeah, so I went on and I went freelance for a while and I was writing 
viral pap. But on the side, I was insistent I wanted to do reporting about things that I thought mattered. And so I started following that. So I wrote like a piece about, um, you know, Wi-Fi in care homes and the lack of connectivity during the pandemic and how that was affecting old people. And it was stories like that where I, you know, I had to perceive them completely off my own back and I wasn't getting like paid anything extra for them. But doing that gave me a bit more confidence. And then Gowden got in touch with like, you know, can you come and cover our politics editor, like editor role? I've never been an editor. Like, I didn't know if, I didn't know really what I was doing, but they believed in me. And I think I had good instincts. I'm still not a great editor. Like I'm an average editor, but I have really good instincts, I think, for a story that won't be covered elsewhere or won't be covered from a particular angle. I think that's what I bring to journalism. And because of Gowden, because I was able to follow those instincts, it got me enough, I guess, of a platform and recognition that other people started getting in touch. Like once you start doing things and filling gaps, you, it's a weird thing where you get co-signed by all these pe- other people. Like suddenly New York Times was asking me to write mm. for them. The Guardian was asking me to write for them. It's like, you you know, you, they'd never noticed me before because of one place asked me, then another place asked me. And then you're on the radio and you're filling all these different things. And it's like, okay, call her. She's there. Um, like I was talking to you the other day, Ash, about how funny it was that a program that should not be named tried to book me as a panelist for their show, but they accidentally left in the email chain uh, this would be a good replacement for Ash because Ash is no, not doing it for a while. And it's like, you are seen as this sort of archetype, mm-hmm. the left-wing archetype, especially left-wing brown woman archetype to fill a role. But yeah, so I, and then Navarra approached me from Galdem and ended up here. And now I feel like I'm starting to really lean into the politics and learn about the politics that it's taken me so long to even have the time to. So you've all been running, running, running. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I love about Navarra. And the thing which I get so much nourishment in terms of working here is that I don't feel I have to be a character. So when you're being pulled in to do a panel on the BBC or on the Jeremy Vine show, wherever else it is, you are on because you are brown, young, woman, left wing. And when it comes to how producers put together these panels, it is that reductive. I am interchangeable with Moya. I am interchangeable with Dahlia or Pfizer Shaheen or whoever else it may be because they're in their heads going, okay, well, we've got um, two MPs and they're both white. We've got, you know, someone from the Telegraph, they're white, and then we've got someone who is miscellaneous. Great. Um, And that's how they think about balance. And that's not always a terrible thing. I think that's also maybe one of the reasons why in the Corbyn years, it was easier for women on the left to get the question time call up than it was men on the left. Because while uh, women could do the double whammy of being like, oh, they're left wing and a woman, and that provides the balance. Like, I think that men have been at a disadvantage in that way. So not necessarily a bad thing, but it means that you can't do a lot of your thinking in public. Mm -hmm. You can't have that space of, I'm here working something out, and this is a really complex issue. And I don't have loads of life experience and I can't claim to be, you know, fucking pression and know everything, but I can't do my thinking in that space. I absolutely can't do it. Whereas here, one of my favorite things is starting with an idea and stress testing it against you or you or Aaron or whoever else it is, both obviously when we're doing something like Navarra Live or Downstream, but also just in the office all the time. Mm. You're just stress testing these ideas. And I think that that's not unusual for media organizations. I'm I'm sure this happens at the Telegraph too, where they're like, well, who should we deport next? And there's a big old hullabaloo (laughs) in the office. Um, But it's certainly something which when you both do mainstream media and you're trying to build this organization, it's just so stark. Like the difference is so big. I want to maybe move on uh, to talk about Galdem and Vice because mm. they're two organizations that um, have been a huge part of your career and how it's developed. And they're also two digital first outlets, which went bust this year. And uh, f- the loss of those two outlets has been massive. Um, I think that they both did really important work in helping people who don't come from super traditional journalistic backgrounds, either in terms of their training and their educational background, but also in terms of things like class and race and helped give them a platform and a place to work. Um, And we're not the only new media kids on the block, although we are now like 
geriatric millennial media. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we're like new media. Um, so what, what happened? I mean, can you give us the, the inside scoop what of what happened? happened at Gowden? I can give you a sanitized scoop about what happened at Gowden, which is essentially, I mean, there's several aspects to it. I would say that Gowden suffered from uh, the position occupied in the media landscape, which was it was meant to be a platform to for marginalized voices of color. And that meant that they lacked both, I think, the wider financial support. They were confined to being sort of like this niche publication. So even though they had massive amounts of goodwill, they only had a certain amount of supporters. And also money was tight. So the people that you attract, if you want to scale up and professionalize in a certain way, you're not necessarily going to get the people who have the ability and capability to do that, especially people who've been traditionally shut out of the media on the salaries that you're offering or able to offer. That's a huge thing for small grassroots publications. They were also very reliant on advertising money and advertising money is fickle. It dries up. It depends on your commercial team. It depends on whether there's a massive recession on or not, or whether the economy is in a downturn, where they want to place that money. Um, and I think it was a mixture of, sadly, a lack of su financial support from its a wider user base. They weren't able to run for whatever reason, fundraising campaigns, particularly towards the end, a specific crowd funder I think was mooted, but was blocked for various reasons, perhaps to save them. There was a reliance on grants. Sometimes that would mean that, you know, paperwork would have to be filled out and some of that paperwork wasn't filled out. And there was also the advertisers. So it's like, if you don't get that contract for Google or whoever, how are you going to pay your staff? For the next 12 months. There was all these things that came into play. And I think because of their unique position, they were also punished for it by not being able to scale up. Well, I mean, this is kind of a question I want to throw to you, which is, do you think that you just can't do both things at the same time? Like you can have a media organization which gets money from Google, or you can have a media organization that tries to have a radical editorial line, but doing both is next to impossible. I suppose my experience is only of Navarra, and I'm not. I'm not sure if it was the radicalism of Galdem that sort of led to its downfall. I wouldn't. I just want to point out. I'm not so saying it's radicalism. I'm saying it's because it was a publication for minority groups. It was seen as a minority publication, and therefore not something that I think wider population would invest in or see as something well, that was meant to represent them, and therefore they had a smaller audience share. But I, I guess maybe the point I'm making is that I don't know why they didn't go for a crowdfunder, but it struck me as if they thought of themselves first and foremost as a politically meaningful outlet, mm. right? Where they're doing something in the media that needs to be done. And it's not just because the media should be more diverse for no reason. It's because mm. these power structures exist in society. Um, you know, if you're a working class woman of color, you roll the dice of life and you lost. And media can be a part of correcting that position of, of disempowerment is that you can make that pitch to your audience and you can go, this is a form of political activity. You're keeping us alive because that's a politically righteous and radical thing to do. And then on the other hand, you're trying to make a pitch to Google and you're saying like, you should give us money because we're like a, a commercially viable um, institution. And, and, and that's two totally different messages and it's two totally different things. I think that's the point. No, I think that is true. And I mean, I've been, I've been speaking to a lot of people recently who work for these, well, I, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say shady organizations because they're not particularly shady. They're all above board, but they're these sort of liberal investigative journalist outlets that aren't a publication. They're like a foundation funded unit and they feed stories to The Guardian, The New York Times, to whoever. And it sort of solves this problem for mainstream journalism, which is that they're, they're struggling to pay for investigative journalism. So they basically outsource it to these foundation funded companies. And, you know, I was asking this, this, this person, so what do you cover? And she says, I, th I think the line was something along, we like to cover the stories which are foundational to the future of the 24th, you know, something super broad. And then the issues are like oligarchy, um, financial corruption, disinformation. And it's always this sort of same five groups of stories and it's never included is like 
abuses of state power by Western governments. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so you've got all of these outlets who are forming these very... Disinformation, innocent... something that Russia does. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, lots of the journalism that comes out of it is is useful and valuable. It's not fake news. You know, lots of this... You know, I, f- I feel like even the Panama Papers and that kind of stuff is sort of along these lines. I know The Guardian initially led with the Vladimir Putin angle because they thought that was the big story. Then everyone's like, we want to know more about David Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, maybe we'll lead on that one. Now. But um, but I I do think that there is... That, that definitely has shaped what mainstream media does. Because even those organizations which have developed, you know, rather impressive funding models, you know, the, the Guardian used to be loss making. Now it's got shed loads of members um, who clearly value what they do. I mean, it's not my politics, but, you know, liberalish people who value what they do and they've, they've got a funding model to some And half degree. of their funding comes from membership now. Yeah, but they also then have stories, you know, funded by the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, which potentially in its own right is valuable but does maintaining that relationship with the bill and melinda gates foundation means that when it comes to a certain form of oppositional journalism you might bite your tongue i every time i click on an article and it turns out to be bill and melinda gates i click off immediately well and it's just a habit and i don't I don't think it's the case that if anything's funded by a grant, that is bad. Mm. I actually think that grant funding can do some really, really important work and can facilitate really important investigations. But when you've got the name of billionaire oligarchs there, and it's this story has come out of billionaire funding directly, I just go, I'm not reading this. Yeah. Well, Aaron and Matt Kennard recently had a very interesting discussion about the Gates Foundation and their funding of the development wing of The Guardian on a recent downstream. So... People Look at that, that they organic want plug organic for content. Plug. But I, I want to read something out from here about advertising from this book I'm reading, which is called Power Without Responsibility, Press Broadcasting and the Internet in Britain, for those at home who'd like to read it too. And it's discussing what happened when people were arguing for why there should be a free press, aka a press that relied on advertised funding rather than a press regulated by sort of like stamp duty, adver- advertisement duty in the 1800s in Britain when that model moved from okay, we've got a press which is gate kept because they have to pay all these taxes. When the press had to pay all these taxes, there was actually a lot more radical press around. That was one of the reasons that there was an argument about why they should bring in, like get rid of these taxes. And both arguments were for this, were not for the liberty of the press, were not to encourage that there should be, you know, more pluralism within press and more radical ideas. Both people who were arguing from different sides about why they should keep or get rid of this ta- stamp duty and this advertisement duty were arguing because they said that it would get rid of these radical working class generated journalists and ideas. And there's a really good quote which someone said about pre- free press, which says, a perfectly free press is one of the greatest safeguards of peace and order, Riley observed the lawyer Jeff Stephen, because journalists come from the comfortable part of society and will err rather on the side of making too much of their interest than on that of neglecting them. And as soon as they got rid of the stamp duty and advertisements became like one of the major ways presses were funded, then the free market completely like wiped out radical presses after sort of like 1850s. So development of an unfettered free market raised publishing costs in a way that prevented groups of workers or individuals with limited resources from owning newspapers. And you immediately saw like this big unstamped press movement, this underground press movement where you'd had, you know, they'd had like 2 million in circulation was just wiped out because the the cost of even starting a newspaper in the first place massively rocketed. Profitability went from, you could make a radical newspaper profitable for, with about 6,000, circulation about 6,200 before these things, these the stamp duties went away. Afterwards, you needed about a quarter of a million to, to make it profitable and you needed huge amounts of startup cash. And the advertisers claimed they weren't, you know, politically neutral, but they weren't putting the advertisements in papers that were going to what they called, you know, the the poor, the working, mm. the working class, because they're like, they're not going to be able to buy it. So they said that it doesn't matter if you have a newspaper with massive amounts of circulation, a radical newspaper as well, generated by the working classes, read by the working classes. There's literally quotes in this book which talk about, you know, having a quarter of that circulation that goes to affluent classes, Adverse, advertisers would much rather flock there. So immediately that's narrowing down. Is that a free press? It's not free at all. I mean, I think this is such an important point because I think it goes right back to the starting point for this conversation in a way, which is, well, why is media bad and what defines a better media? Is that you're only going to end up with half the answer if you explain why media is bad by pointing at individual personalities and you go, it's because of this person, it's because of this person. But actually it's because media 
like politics, I think is an expression of class interests. And so when you think about what class interests are being expressed through a particular media organization, I think funding is really key to it. I mean, the example that I want to give is Vice. So Vice, obviously, it marketed itself on this like punk rock ethos. So it's like on Tuesday, we're going to go into ISIS held Raqqa and Thursday, we're going to do ketamine and go to the Westminster dog show. And it was about this kind of like gonzo, fearless, irreverent tone. And it was something which when it first came out was compelling. It wasn't like another product in the mass media at that time. And uh, one of the Vice co-founders, Shane Smith, he had a vision of where he wanted to go with it, which is you've got a magazine, both a print and a digital product, which has just such a high amount of mystique about it. It ha- seems to have like tapped into this like cool factor, this like inevitable cool factor, but then rather trying to go, and then what we're going to do is just totally dominate the millennial market. And we're going to make our money from having like crazy circulation Instead, he goes, I'm going to leverage this reputation of having tapped into the millennial market in order to attract massive amounts of venture capital. And so that's how Vice very famously ended up with a $5.7 billion valuation, despite not having a customer base that was anywhere near that. And what he would do, Shane Smith, is that he would have these meetings where he'd make pitches to investors. And don't forget, investors included Rupert Murdoch, Bob Iger from Disney and how he was managed, how he managed to like get all this money from them was that he tapped into fears of their own obsolescence and irrelevance. So he'd go, well, I have Gen Y, I have social and you guys are dying, right? Give us money. And because everybody wants to buy the secret source, they fucking did, right? But if you, if you looked under the hood for one moment and you were like, hang on, you say that you've got a market of 6 million millennials in Denmark and there aren't 6 million millennials in Denmark at all, um, you you would know that it was all bullshit. So of course it was going to boom and bust because they ended up with this valuation, which was way above where it was. So then they had to like rapidly expand and put loads of money into doing it. This is money which has come from Disney investments, Murdoch investments, other hedge funds as well. And you're not making money because your initial valuation was bullshit. So you're making money to try and catch up with this image, which is built on nothing. And then you go, oh my God, we've got no revenue. And then the layoffs came and the downsizing came. And now something which was a valuable media product, because alongside a lot of the stuff, which maybe people would think of as just like lifestyle or trivial. I mean, I think some of that stuff was funny. I think it was entertaining. There was actually some really valuable journalism Mm. going on. And now it's all dead because it was playing this game of like bullshit Olympics with itself. And, you know, the guy who was peddling the crap like gets out with all his money, but it's the young journalists who are fucked by it. I mean, I don't know, like how did you feel when you when you saw the, the Vice story? Um, I mean, I suppose I think they do some really good documentaries, like their documentaries in like war zones are like really good. So it is a shame that the thing has collapsed. I mean, I, I don't know enough about Vice to say, you know, I, I don't know, the, I'm, I'm not averse in the critiques of Vice as it were. I just watch YouTube videos sometimes and they were quite good. Um, but I suppose the collapse of Vice and Galdem and lots of these sort of organizations, I suppose it has changed my perspective about Navara. Although, the, I mean, this I changed my perspective about this quite a while ago, which was that sort of, it used to be the case because I was, I was, you know, really, I wasn't like a very late comer, but a bit of a late comer. I was like, we could be growing quicker. You know, mm-hmm. we could be in a better studio by now. We could have more reach by now. Oh, yeah. We what initially we put is, Michael in the shipping container. What we need is like decisive action to make it happen and ambition. But Navara, because it's, you know, it's a not a non-hierarchical organization, but it's relatively very non-hierarchical. We're all on the same wage. Um, there, uh, There isn't a particularly sort of strict management regime as it were we're kind of left to our own devices we are yeah a a relatively slow moving organization when it comes to sort of internal changes when it comes to especially physical investments and there was you know i was like you know why aren't we bigger you know and especially that was frustrating you know when it was like we're on the cusp of a labor government we need to be really goddamn big as soon as possible but actually i think the fact that we moved quite slowly does put us on very very secure ground now and we haven't had any boom and bust periods. It's just been constantly up. Um, and that's partly because we have, you know, 
I think people sort of see our YouTube numbers and they're sort of like, where the hell did this media organization come from? They must have like had this strategy of let's go big, go quick. But no, actually we've been building really, really slowly and sustainably, which has its disadvantages, but means that where we stand now, we're an organization where everyone trusts each other. I don't have to spend any time thinking about like internal. When I talk to people at other big mainstream publications, all they talk about is like this factional beef between this wing of the comment department and this wing of the lifestyle magazine. And I'm just sort of like, I'm so You glad can name I the Guardian, you know. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I won't name the particular journalist. But I, I'm so glad that I work at an organization where like, I don't have to engage in any of that. I just think about politics and think about what I talk about. And that is because of that slow growth that does mean we are on a really, really sustainable path. But do you think that also meant that you could develop your own chops as a journalist and as a host because we grew slowly. Because when I started at Navara, it was 2015. And the first thing I ever did was a Navara FM discussion about the protests in Baltimore following um, the- Michael Brown. Uh, her, it, no, it was a Freddie Gray, oh, Freddie I think. Gray. It was Freddie Gray. Um, because he'd been taken on what the police called a rough ride where they put him in the back of a van um, unsecured and he was just thrown around and it was, it was hor horrifically violent. And that was the first thing that I ever did. And like Michael, I never saw myself getting into the media at all. I always thought I was going to go back into the academy, do a PhD that nobody read. And <laughs> that was it. That was it. Um, but I was able to develop skills that otherwise I would have had to go back to uni for or done an unpaid internship for. Mm. I was able to learn how to broadcast and how to speak on a microphone and how to behave in front of a camera and how not to have a mental breakdown every time I see my own image on a screen. Um, and that's because we grew slowly enough to do it. And I wonder like one, like does that mimic your experience? And then two, what's it like coming into the organization when we're a bit bigger and you can't do all of your learning on the job in the same way? No, I mean, a hundred, a hundred like the slow growth for me, a hundred percent. Like if, if I'd sort of auditioned, to be the host of a political talk show in 2015, and it was like going to be broadcast, on, so I would I would not have passed. <laughs> but because I've done it so many times, iteratively, different formats here, there, I can talk to a camera like it's my friend now. So people are sort of like, how do you say, how do you seem so relaxed on camera? It's like I talk to it like three times a week. But that is you like that, make love to the that camera. That is possible because you know we've grown up with the organisation. So as the organisation has professionalised, we've professionalised. Um, which I suppose does make it very interesting what it is like to come from that. I suppose you're a, you're a media professional already, right? I was a media professional already, although to what degree? I, the main thing I think about Navara and coming into Navara is because of the slow growth and because of security, I see it as something that I want to stick with maybe for a lifetime. I've been in media organizations where the sand is moving very quickly under your feet. You're there either on short-term contracts or, you know, when I was at the Women's Lifestyle magazine, it was the beginning of the end you kept saw it you see with these uh places the circling of the drain it was also similar as well with vice like i never wanted to go for a job there because every now and then there'd be a round of layoffs and you were just aware that these these layoffs they get tighter and tighter and tighter and there's nothing left to lay off and then suddenly they're bankrupt you saw that the the models of advertiser Advertiser dependency, uh, commercial dependency, they weren't working. You'd hear the stressed out commercial department talking about how they hadn't brought in a campaign, they needed to fill this space. And you just knew that people's jobs were linked to that. And that the content, because it was content rather than journalism, was also linked to that. And I wanted to do actual reporting. I wanted to learn that. It was no really for me to learn that or do that. When I went to Gowden, there was more space. But again, there was advertiser dependency. And the, even though I wasn't working directly with the commercial department, we had tiny, tiny budgets. There was no time for me to upskill in the same ways that I could at Navara, surrounded by people who've been doing their jobs for so long and have the time to teach me these things because they've had the space. And I think that's also something with Gowden. We were all kind of like the same level and rubbing along. And there's a ceiling you reach in professionalization when you don't have other people able to come in and help you or willing to come and help you in the same ways. Um, and so when I joined Navara, it sounds so pathetic, but I really am wedded to my job. It is sadly, and people would be very upset about me saying this because you're not meant to be wedged to your job and you're not meant to identify yourself with your job as a worker because it complicates how you can bargain for things and you know the, it changes the objectivity with which you view your, it's a job as a job. But I love my job so much. Like I would gladly spend a lifetime here because I see it as a long-term project. I want this to be something sustainable. I want this to not be another media organization that slips away. I want it to be somewhere where both we, you know, have a whole generation of journalists able to work here produce really great 
pluralistic left-wing journalism that challenges the status quo, but also somewhere where people can invest in us as readers and stick with us for a lifetime. It's like, this is your media organization. This is where you go to. You are a part of the Navara readership. Um, so yeah, when I joined, I was kind of like, it was funny. I'd never even thought about when you approached me, Ash. And as soon as I was like, as soon as I came, I was like, I'm all in. I'm all in. Like, it's a life sentence. It's a life sentence, body and soul. I'm like, I'm all into this. And I, you said it's hard for me to learn the job. I learn the job every single day. I came to Navarra and I was like, finally, this is the place where I can sit down and relax and realize how little I know and how the people around me, you know, you have such a wealth of knowledge. And even when we disagree, it's like, I learned so much from that. The professionalization, I was so lucky to come in when you guys are professionalized because you had a structure. It wasn't, you know, I sometimes hear about people saying, oh, it's Navarra before. This was like maybe people were beefing with each other, whatever. And when I come in, slick, great. Like, you know, you have these structures in place when we have disagreements, we have meetings to talk about them. It's always respectful. I really like people sometimes talk to me on social media, like, how can you work with this person? I'm like, I respect every one of my colleagues so much. Mm -hmm. I don't think you realize the deep affection that I have, even when I disagree with people. It's, this is, it inspires a great passion in me, which is very funny. That was Moya talking about why she's so disgustingly grateful to work for an organization that is actively seeking to strengthen the left. My God, women have some dignity. But look, we're not reliant on fragile or flaky funding models built on hot air and bullshit. And that's something to be proud of. So many people thought that we would have failed by now, but we're growing from strength to strength. We're people powered. None of this could happen without your donations. So consider this a call out to everyone who trusts our journalism and anyone who values what we do. To all of you who want thorough, rigorous journalism that isn't in the palm of an outrageously elite few. If you can, join our monthly supporters and donate one hour's wage per month or whatever you can afford today. Head to navaramedia.com forward slash support or click the link in the description. Cheers, Gav. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think it's so, I, th I mean, that's one of the things that I talk about. I'm a about. company woman. I am. I'm a company woman too. <laughs> like, Terrible. Oh. You know, like I, me and my partner are always having discussions where he's like, you are always working. We've just gone on our first holiday, basically ever in our relationship where I wasn't working on the holiday. And he was just like, this is really unhealthy. And I was like, but I love my oh, job. Yeah. Why wouldn't I do it all the time? <laughs> um, so yeah, we're essentially, you know, I'm in a throuple with my partner and Navara. Um, I just want to add to that as I'm well. I'm still looking for a third. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I want to add to that though, that one of the reasons like, that I'm able to critique Navarra and I think we're able to look at the failings of Navarra and really listen to the audiences because we love it, mm. because we want to succeed, because we don't want to just be reflective of a particular faction of the left or whatever. We want it to be a really, you know, professional, serious organization. Mm. We don't want to be small time. No small time shit. No small time shit. But this is the thing which I want to move on to. Um, and I want to start maybe by talking about uh, disagreement with relation to our funding model. Mm. Because I was watching the succession finale this week. And no spoilers, please. No spoilers. Um, Logan Lazarus-like <laughs> kind of came up like The Undertaker and he won WrestleMania. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, so I, I was really struck by one of the lines in the succession finale where Tom Wormscams is talking about his role as head of ATN, which is their fictionalized version of mm. Fox News, if you don't watch the show. And he says... I give the customer what he wants. I don't think it's my place to offer dietary advice. And this is a dynamic which Jesse Armstrong in A Long Piece for the Guardian examines a bit more where he talks about this mad dance between Fox News and its viewers, where sometimes it's Fox leading, sometimes it's the viewers, but the wine gets stronger, the music gets quicker, and there is just this enveloping chaos where you've got a mutually radicalizing death spiral of Fox News and its viewers. And when we're talking about radicalizing, we're not talking about, and then they all understood their position as workers and that the boss is an exploiter. No, it's like they think that Target is in the grip of a Hispanic LGBT nonce cabal, like crazy. Um, and it would be really easy for us to say, well, because we take truth seriously and because we don't believe in creating hate figures of marginalized people that we're different. But it made me reflect on the fact that we are reliant on audience goodwill because that is mm -hmm. our funding model. So how do you make room for things which might challenge, contradict, or even piss off some of our audience? How do we handle that content? How do we make that content? Or do you think there's a degree of self-censorship involved? Do you want to go first, Michael? Yeah, I'll go. I suppose 
there obviously is an element of self-censorship to some degree, but that's, I think that, that, that will be the case everywhere. And I suppose, I, I suppose potentially, I know that if I'm saying something that I'm not sure will go down too well with the audience, it needs a higher standard of proof than if I say something that the audience kind of already agree with. But I, I don't think that's particularly unhealthy. I mean, I think the way we've dealt with it with, with Navarra Live is we have just lots of different viewpoints. So I think the audience will often be like, oh, I disagree with Michael here. Dahlia's really smashed it. And that's fine. There'll be some other people watching it, hopefully thinking it's the other way around. <laughs> Uh, they don't seem to comment as much. Um, but I think having that sort They're of... They're the silent majority. Yeah, having, having that diversity of voices on the show, obviously within the left, um, is, is, is helpful for that. And it gives you a lot more space to be honest and open because you don't need... What you're saying isn't... Basically, you don't, you don't want the audience commitment to Navarra Media to be based on what any one of us says. You want it to be based on the fact that the whole organization and the totality of the people they hear from present one, a sort of useful and honest analysis of the world. And two, they feel that this is furthering the kind of politics they want. And all our politics are slightly different, but we're all in a pretty much similar um, direction. And I think the audience recognize that. And I think it's also about, you know, I really like it when I meet right wing people who tell me like, oh yeah, I'm Blair Wright. Even Tories that say, but I really like watching your show mm -hmm. because it's quite like honest and open. And you do kind of say some things that they don't normally say in the mainstream media. So I, I, I do think there is a lot of value in just making a good show, which is watchable and viewable. Um, but then obviously, you also do, you know, you want to stay true to your roots and sort of really, I suppose it's about valuing what your audience think, but not necessarily just repeating it. And also recognizing that your audience is a huge diversity. Like it, it, there is no one part of Navarra Media's audience. And I suppose that the issue with Fox News, right, is that they are, their audience has these sort of two figures, which is Fox News speaking to them and Donald Trump. Mm. So they are constantly in this interplay between, we know that our, you know, our audience are almost captive in a way to Donald Trump and what he says, and that puts them in an incredibly difficult position. But I think our audience is so diverse that there isn't any, I, I don't feel like, oh, I can't disagree with this person because that will upset our audience. Because I don't think our audience have that relationship with anyone, really, or at least not the, the majority of our audience. I mean, I think it's interesting you say that because even in the Jeremy Corbyn years, there was a lot of room for us to be critical of Labour policy, and we were. Um, we were especially critical of some of the policing announcements. There was you know, a really wide range of opinions about what Labour should do about Brexit. And weirdly, I actually think after you know, Jeremy's leadership came to an end. And I think that the attacks on his character, this attempt to kind of cast him as like politics number one pollutant, I think as that's not gone away and in some ways has intensified on the part of, you know, the establishment liberal left, is that it's then become more difficult to say things which are critical of, the Corbynite wing of the party. And that's not to say that all of our criticisms will be right and the Corbynite wing of the party will be wrong, or that we are the sole determinants of like what's morally or politically or factually right, you know, to to air is human. Um, but I think that that's one area where I go, oh, this is a difficult thing to do sometimes. And then the other thing is that actually some audience responses on some things over time has really helped me see where I'm wrong. Mm. It's really helped me change my mind on certain things. I mean, I kind of almost want to do like a separate piece, which is like a mea culpa for all the things I fucked up on. Um, and it's not necessarily because the facts have changed. It's because actually the interaction from our audience and laying out of a different position has persuaded me. And I think that that's something which, again, we couldn't have done without social media. That's so inherent to the form of what we do and the fact that we are this kind of like bastard offspring of like content creators and media organization mm -hmm. at the same time, you know? Um, but that's also really allowed me to continue my political development even when on like broadcast mode. Um, but yeah, what do you think about about presenting <sighs> information or an analysis which is at odds with a portion of the audience? I mean, <laughs> I, 
think it, I think it's a difficult question because when you're presenting that analysis, you don't know that it's going to be at odds with a portion of the audience until you've done it. Often, like it's when we're doing stuff, I think what's guiding me is not so much within my work thinking about oh, is this going to piss people off? Is this going to alienate people? It's trying to think: is the reporting that I've done, or is the knowledge that I've gathered, or is the opinion I've done well researched, well backed up, and do I believe in it? And only then will I put that out. And if you're coming from that perspective, which I hope with Navara, most of the time I think we do, then I think there is always going to be room and grace from another portion of the audience. So people can understand your reasonings. If you're able to actually articulate your reasonings for why you've done something, sometimes we fuck up and sometimes we get it wrong. But so long as you're able to articulate that reasoning and be like, okay, this is what I thought. This is actually why, you know, this was, this in hindsight, this was a mistake. And this is the process we're now adopting so that that mistake will not happen again. I think that's that's all you can ask for for a media company. Um, and yeah, I think also with, you know, pissing off parts of the audience. I'm trying to think of things that I've done that have particularly annoyed the audience. I don't think anything I've done at Navara has particularly annoyed the audience. Like things I've done elsewhere have. And I will listen to, I will listen and look at critique. I will try not to reply to it in the immediate sense because I think that's the worst possible time to be replying to critique. You have to kind of sit with it and sift the sort of wheat from the chaff, which is what is a really useful piece of feedback that you were getting here and what is just a knee jerk reaction that that person has had in, you know, under 140 characters. Um, I think one thing that people do miss about Navarra that we really should be pushing more and that I'm excited to be part of pushing more is that we are pluralist. Mm. We do disagree. That's one of our great strengths. We should be, rep we're trying to represent a really, really broad, like demographic and coalition, which is the left. Like there's, as we've talked about so much, there's so many disagreements that you're going to piss someone off. But so long as we are getting across, that's part of the Navarra project and package that we are going to disagree and we're going to put forward things so that you can engage with them critically because I think that's also something with media nowadays. People expect to be, you know, they think that they should be spoon fed stuff that they agree with from the jump. But it's like, how do you develop your critical thinking? And I'm not talking here about platforming set of people. I'm talking about when you put forward ideas and argument, the, that rhetor rhetorical sort of exchange, that discourse, that dialectics. <laughs> is that how you pronounce it? That is how you pronounce it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is part of the left tradition. That's part of the left intellectual tradition. That's part of the activist tradition. Like that is fundamental to how we think our ideas, how we gestate ideas, how we get this, like come to consensus in the first place. That's exciting. I like being challenged by you guys. It makes me have to think. So what do you think we disagree on? I mean, Oof. I know that particularly on Navarro Live, we get these great opportunities to just like throw something back and forth. And that is the best bit of my week is when I get to do that with one of you on Navarra Live because it feels fun and mm. it doesn't feel like you're being hauled over the coals and if you don't defend this position successfully, you'll die. It feels like a really enlivening and life affirming thing to do. It's like, oh, I'm talking about things that really matter with people mm. who I love most in the world. This is fucking great and I get paid for it. Um, but there's obviously a huge range of opinions in the organization. There's also lots of difference of opinion from people that you don't see. So one of the mm. people who you don't see on camera is Craig Gent. He's been with us from the start and he is like, the anarchist who is still an anarchist yeah. at Navarra Media. Um, you know, I've still never seen him wear a colour, ever. Uh, <laughs> it turns out anarchists can organise things because he's one of the main reasons Navarra is still here. Yeah. <laughs> he's we the one that tells you not to buy the new piece of kit. Yeah, he's the one who's budgeting like... anarchists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, I think a really big way in which my politics has changed is that I have critiques of the state, which are still mm. very inflected by my time running around in black block, but I've reconciled myself to the existence of the state. I don't think you can really deal with climate change unless you have one. Mm. And that's been like a real change that I've had. But the thing that you guys won't see is that we've got Craig who is still like, they're gonna get rid of that sucker one day, don't you worry. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's all this disagreement that you don't even see, but I mean, in terms of disagreements that maybe we have in this room or ones that you just think of as like particularly pressing within the organization, Oof. name one. We've got the police. We yeah, always, we've got Michael yeah, the cop. I would abolish less things probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael, Michael's, you're more reformist, right? I'm a, I'm a massive reformist. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, we should do that on a like, oh. massive reformist. <laughs> I'm literally a massive reformist. <laughs> 
We probably would sell a lot. We should do a partnership yeah. with the Guardian. That, one. that would be interesting to see how many of those sold. I think that's yeah, that's probably one of them. Yeah, I suppose I'm le- my I'm less interested in sort of like seeing something that's bad, critiquing it, and then saying let's get rid of it. Like I'm also not into the whole you know Marx thing of you know politics isn't about writing cookbooks for the future. It's like I want to know what it looks like, and if you can't explain to me in a plausible way what it looks like. I feel no reason to endorse that position. And I, I feel like often what you get is this is, a, this is an institution, it's done bad things. The, the, the reason it's done bad things is because it's an inherently bad institution, therefore get rid of the organization. And I'm a bit like, what next? And I know obviously, you know, there are police abolitionists, prison abolitionists who, who have answers to those questions. It just so happens that I've never found any of those answers particularly convincing, or I feel like the meaning of words have just somewhat been changed. So if police abolitionists say, well, it'd be so different, it won't be the police. I'm like, well, it's their job to enforce laws and can they arrest people? Sounds like the police to me. Same thing with prisons. Can you leave it? Probably a prison. Can you leave it? <laughs> you know, unless this it's a, room? Un- un- unless, <laughs> unless all criminals you're, you're diagnosing as having mental health problems and sectioning, which to me is even more sinister yeah, because than, it's indefinite. than prisons. Well, also because it's, it, it's, it, it's pathologizing. Like sometimes I think it's, uh, that to me seems a bit more totalitarian to sort of say, oh, we're, we're putting you away for your own good as opposed to saying, you broke the law, we have this place where you go when you do that, and you can't leave. Like, to me, that is something which we're probably going to need in every society we have, in every industrialized society, people say we haven't had it all the time. I think in every industrialized society where you've got millions of people living in a very small space, you're going to need some rules, and you're going to need someone to enforce them, and you're going to need a place for people to go where they can't leave, if they've broken at least some of those rules. And for me, that- And that place is called Broccoli. <laughs> This is a really niche London joke. It's just because every time I've gone to a house party in Broccoli, the transports have been fucked it's and very, I've not been able to leave. It is very hard to leave Broccoli. I don't think it quite meets the definition of prison. Um, that totally I've provided. To be fair, there's also a definition that would apply to anywhere where the transport is fucked and say Wales, where you literally cannot get from South Wales straight to North Wales because the transport's so fucked. You have to go over the border and back again. That's how, sorry, that's, I'd abolish, that's how that, I'd abolish that prison. I'd ab- <laughs> abolish <laughs> Wales. Wales. No, I've, I've, I've reformed the transport in Wales I've, there, now we've swapped. <laughs> I would not, I, when I said I would abolish, I don't want Wales to be a prison anymore. You know, I want them to have very, very good transport. <laughs> That's good. I, as as a Welsh border person, then I'm obviously riding out for Wales right now. As a prison warden, for as a <laughs> the marches. Well, don't get into the marches in England. <laughs> That's the whole fucking can of worms. I really enjoy that there are on the viral live very much two tendencies of the left, which is me, the massive reformist, and then lots of like radicals, and then we can banter, and the audience can sort of. They pro- lots of them will know in advance who sort of they more side with, but mm. it's still useful to see that sort of conversation articulated. It's funny because I think a lot of as sort of like I would say Navarra next generation almost I think I'm also sometimes just unformed on these ideas I haven't decided which ones I settle in that I often oscillate between the positions of in theory I would love to pursue abolition in practice maybe I am more of a reformer than I like to believe deep down in the short term but I haven't yet come to like these concrete conclusions like for example I don't think I'm a communist but then (gasps) (gasps) But I'm also not sure. I can be convinced. I think I think the problem is with a lot of these things, I'm very I'm still in the nascent era of like my political development. I have strong convictions about things in the immediate sense, about what is right and what is wrong and what ethically I should be doing and what powers like my journalism. But when it comes to my political education, as I said, then I'm still learning. And like, am I a communist? I'm not at the moment I think I'm if a social. If I got you edging. the t shirt, would you? I wouldn't wear it. <laughs> but those are from my own own opinions. I don't want to get duffed up on the tube. <laughs> I've, never, I've never worn that. I'm literally a I'm t- <laughs> Yeah, because that would be a lie. Yeah. That's a lie. We had a debate a very long time ago, didn't we? Me, you, Owen Jones, communism versus socialism. Yeah, did you have a t-shirt that said I'm literally a social democrat? I was the host, so I was... I kept As my a true social democrat! Close to my chest. <laughs> As a true social democrat, just presiding over, yeah. adding adding some order and structure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I still don't know. I don't know if I'm actually a communist yet and if I actually believe fully that that's something that could be enacted, but I could be convinced. It's- so I would really want to talk about the New York Times Nick Cohen story. So what happened to catch everybody up is that several women came forward with allegations of sexual harassment perpetrated by then star columnist at The Observer, Nick Cohen. 
and the content of their allegations that he'd made unwanted sexual advances. It's not something that he specifically addresses, but it's also not something that he specifically denies. What he says to the New York Times is, I assume it's stuff I was doing when I was drunk. And of course, I find the content of the allegations incredibly disturbing, which is that here is somebody who is really, really powerful, really, really well paid, has this massive profile at a massive newspaper, and seems to have been abusing that power in order to sexually harass young women who are much more precarious, just in a really basic employment way. I find that really disturbing. But one of the things which I feel really troubling, which I find really troubling, is that these allegations had been in the public domain for ages, right? And I understand that just because something is on Twitter doesn't mean it can go into print straight away. Rightly, there are really stringent checks that need to be carried out because people have a right to privacy. People have a right to not be defamed. And I wouldn't want us to go and good journalism is when you print every rumor and that's that. But the Financial Times actually had a story on it first. And it appears to have been a very good story, something which went through all of the processes that you need to in order to print something like this. But the editor of the Financial Times, Rula Calaf, killed it. And it ended up being an American newspaper, the New York Times, that ran with it. And I think what this demonstrates is that there is this unwritten code of emerita, of secrecy and omission and ignoring. And the UK media, there's so much that they pretend not to see that they turn away from until someone else looks at it and then a critical mass of people do the noticing and then it's fine for everyone to notice it. And one of the golden rules of that not noticing, of that silencing, is that they never, ever go for one of their own. And is that something that you guys have observed in your own interactions with mainstream media or that you've seen in how stories come out? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen it, you know, personally and upfront. Although I suppose, yeah, I mean, as you say, these allegations about Nick Cohen have been circulating for a while. I mean, I think even, you know, one of the alleged victims put it up on Twitter and that was the only reason it ever actually really, the, the ball started moving because before that, until you had that person who puts himself in a very vulnerable position, by the way, and says publicly on Twitter, something like that, that's, that's a very high threshold to meet for something to be investigated. I, I suppose I think what this story says for me is about, you know, on one level, it's, you know, this conspiracy of a murder between people who are part of the same journalistic club. I think it is also about the costs and benefits of a story. So reading the NYT piece, I think the editor of the Financial Times said, you know, the official reason for killing it is Nick Cohen isn't a big enough figure for a business readership to publish this story about. What's not said is he's not a big enough figure relative to the costs of publishing this, which is that he's going to have good lawyers and there are going to be very good contacts who are going to be upset with us if we publish this story about him. Um, some people in the organization know the guy. Right. So she's saying the public interest isn't big enough to publish it. Well, if that was about, you know, some unconnected left winger who didn't have any friends in those newspapers, yeah, the public interest would have been exactly the same, but the cost would have been much lower. So they would have gone for it. If it had been so about what, Aaron Bastani, they'd yeah, have so, printed it. So when they're doing these when they're doing these these costs and benefits, this, this sort of cost benefit analysis to use the sort of economist term, because they are also, you know, financial organizations that want to make business decisions that are appropriate. The the costs for attacking someone outside the establishment are so much lower than attacking someone inside it that the public interest benefit also can be so much lower. So they can publish something about the left or make up something about the left when the or, or speculate as to something about someone on the left. And the the public benefit can be so, so low because the cost is so low. And in this situation, I mean, I don't, I, I can imagine that the the editor of the FT was just sort of in, in her mind, acting in the interests of the organization, but the interests are fixed really in favor of people within the establishment because it's only them who can apply these these costs to keep stuff hidden from the public. But also people pretend not to notice things. And this is something which I've experienced myself, which is way back during the halcyon days of the Corbyn era, a story appeared in the sun under the name of its uh, political editor or deputy political editor, I can't remember, Tom Newton Dunn. 
and it was a hijacked labor conspiracy network mm. map, which supposedly showed all of the people who'd secretly captured labor. So that included myself and also long deceased philosopher Stanley Fish and Michel Foucault. So what rarefied company. But it had these little clickable fact files where it showed the sources for each name being connected. And these little clickable fact files included an explicitly anti-Semitic conspiracy website mm. and also Aryan Unity. So I'll give you three guesses for what kinds of politics Aryan Unity had. So People who like Greek yogurty drinks. <laughs> That's Iran, but well done. Right, okay. <laughs> 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 um, but like, here you've got Tom Newton Dunn putting out a story where it's being sourced and quotes mm. and points towards neo-Nazi websites, and then it gets taken down. And it seems that the origins of this map, it comes from bits of far-right internet. It was initially called the traitor's map. Um, and I thought that was pretty fucked up. I thought it was pretty fucked up that in you know one of the most widely read newspapers in the country, my name is on a map which shares its sourcing from Aryan unity and that it points to a conspiracy theory, which is complete horseshit. And it seems to me that the purpose of this is to make the people in the map, turn them into targets, you know, by saying that they're subverting democracy. These aren't journalists who are doing their job and happen to have different politics from you. They're doing something which is shady and doing something wrong. If, any of us put out an article which linked to a neo-Nazi website, do you think we'd get invited back onto Politics Live or that do question time? Or that if our or that if our YouTube channel got nuked again, that we'd be getting all of the support from unusual sources? No. Our establishment legitimacy would be dead. It would be finito. You would have everybody rallying around going, I knew that these were a bunch of anti-Semitic wrongers, rah, 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 and it would be done. Nothing happened to this guy. Nothing. He then ended up getting a really well-paid job for Talk TV. He still managed to be someone who, you know, is able to rub shoulders with the center left. Mm. And nobody, as far as I know, has said anything to his face saying, why did you publish that mad neo-Nazi map, right? Did you did you do your due diligence? Did you click through all those sources that you published? Did you know what Aryan unity meant? Nobody has said that. And so this is what I mean by the strategic looking away, which is there's one way in which that happens with the Nick Cohen story, which is the costs of doing it, some of which are financial and a lot of which are political and social, don't seem to outweigh the benefits. And then there is just something which to me is so mad. And it's about who's an insider and who's an outsider. That because this guy is an insider, because he's got a lobby pass, he's one of us. So he can't have done anything that wrong. And, you know, who are the targets anyway? Just these losers. I don't even think with Nick Cohen, it's specifically about the lobby pass. It's just that he is of a generation where all his peers and friends are in the same sort of powerful positions. So they all give him a pass. And that adds up to what I called in an article I wrote about this and the sort of a murder, which is not a deliberate, I would say it's an unconscious thing, but individual stonewalling. So it adds up to collective institutional stonewalling. And I think it's interesting if we talk about Rula Khalif at the Financial Times, because she was also the editor of someone called Sebastian Payne, mm. who he became the Whitehall correspondent in 2019. She became editor in 2020. Sebastian Payne, literally his job is to cover politics, is to cover politics for Financial Times, which is widely considered one of the more impartial papers um, and objective papers. I'm a fan of the Financial Times myself. Like, it's funny, you talk to quite a lot of lefties and they're like, I quite like the Financial Times. Oh yeah, every lefty, every lefty loves, loves the, the Financial, Times. Times. Like Financial Times. I don't have a subscription, I'm not that rich, but uh, I enjoy reading it. But it's like, everyone's like, yeah, it's, you know, they're so focused on like just what's good for the economy. They actually sometimes tell the truth. It's it's an interesting thing if you talk to lefties in the Financial Times. Anyway, but Seb Payne, white correspondent, his job is to report objectively on politics. Seb Payne is now standing to be the next Tory, he wants to be on the shortlist, he's on the shortlist to be the next Tory candidate for Selby, where Nigel Adams is standing back. He also the quit the Financial Times to head up a right Tory supporting think tank. But there's a really interesting tidbit in a recent edition of Pop Bitch, 
which is in the public domain. It's central news boxes, and you can get it news boxes in boxes in news boxes. News boxes. <laughs> I lo- we should invent that. Um, <laughs> you could be like a, uh, a store news boxes we'll drop off stories to in your you, news just- box. Um, yeah, so you can find this edition online, and it's, it tells a story about how when Seb Payne was meant to be going and covering Jacob Rees Mogg for the Financial Times, the photographer got down to Jacob Rees Mogg's house and found Seb Payne there in a dressing gown because he'd done a little sleepover because he's such good friends with Jacob Rees Mogg. He was already there. He was having a whole weekend of it. This is how entwined these people are. And someone like Rula Khalif, you know, she's described in this New York Times article about Nick Cohen and why she allegedly spiked this story as not an insider to British British media. She's not like the Ian Hislops who was the, who was the editor of Private Eye where Nick Cohen had a, a column and very, very, uh, not deliberately, what's the word? Um, conspicuously. Very conspicuously did not report on any of the insider goings on or Cohen's departure. All the times, even though he knew about it and confirmed that to New York Times, um, even though, you know, Private Eye is a magazine which unduly concerns itself with what's going on at Guardian News mm. Media. It takes up, especially when it comes to, you know, their trans coverage, it takes up so much space. They they have a direct relationship with Guardian News Media and the people who work there didn't cover anything about Nick Cohen's departure or the reasons surrounding it. Um, and Ruda Khalif is not an insider like Ian Hislop, but still something prevented her, A, from you know saying to her Whitehall correspondent, maybe you shouldn't be spending the night at the house of a Tory MP if that you know that happened, as it said in Pop Bitch. Maybe you shouldn't be, you know, be so close to these people. Maybe, you know, don't make such an open secret of the fact that you literally want to stand to be a Tory MP in the next few years because everyone knew about it. Everyone, everyone, was, knew, about everyone it. knew about it. It was, it was an, it was an in-joke in, in the industry. And she, why did she also say to one of her star investigative reporters, we're not going to cover this story about a very powerful political columnist who's been accused of sexual misconduct by multiple women and we have them on record saying it and maybe you should run an opinion piece instead and then the opinion piece never runs. She's not an insider and yet she's still... There was an unconscious pressure there that still made her not run this story. And we have to look at what that is. And I've talked about this in an article I wrote for Navarra about it. But I think there's two things, which is the direct influence when you have like the in his locks who are like, this is my mate. I'm not going to cover this because it's my mate. And like, let's give him a bit of grace, you know? And then you have the ruler Khalees and this fear there. The fear of ostracization, fear of you put your head in the parapet, fear of the legal teams, fear of those consequences. And those things... At these big media organizations, you often have enough people who are fearful, enough people who are mates, that it adds up to a collective silence. But you also have people who've got shared ideological interests. And the example which springs up for me Mm. is Neil Coyle. Mm -hmm. So Neil Coyle had the Labour whip suspended. It has now been restored. But he had it suspended after racially abusing a lobby journalist. And also an accusation of harassment. That came out afterwards, but the whip Mm. was suspended after he um, made really, really horrible comments to uh, Henry Dyer. And when this happened... You suddenly had all of these lobby journalists, uh, Alex Wickham is the one that comes to mind, going, it's been known for ages that Neil Coyle has no place in Westminster. And I go, well, if it's been known for ages, why have you called anybody who has criticised Neil Coyle a crank and mm. a lunatic and you know, a corbinite? Why has Neil Coyle been a source Exactly. For you for so long. So Neil Coyle, during the Corbyn years, was everyone's go-to guy for Labour MP dissatisfied with the leadership. You know, the next day following the defeat in 2019, there was a piece where Toby Helm, who's the political editor for The Observer, I think, um, was, you know, on the doorstep with Neil Coyle. And both of them were walking around being like, everyone hates Jeremy Corbyn. Everyone hates Jeremy Corbyn. All I'm hearing is that everyone hates Jeremy Corbyn. Well, I've hated him for ages. Well, I've hated him for millennia. I hated him since I was conceived. You know, it was just this kind of thing. And that's because, you know, there was a ready-made story and it was a story that the lobby wanted, which is this guy's a disaster. And he is messing up his party. And then you had individuals in the party who had lost their potential for career career advancement under Jeremy Corbyn. And you also had, I think, a lot of lobby journalists who suddenly found themselves with a book of useless contacts because it's not worth going to, you know, um, Yvette and Ed's house for dinner every so often anymore because, you know, they're not in positions of power. And so you had an alignment of interests, which is Jeremy Corbyn is bad for our jobs. He's bad for our job prospects. He's bad for our jobs if you're on the right wing of the Labour Party and he's bad for our job prospects if you're a lobby journalist and you've been fnaf and like, you know, calling the left, you know, 
fidel loving tofu eating beret wearers or whatever and it meant that somebody who had a well-known pattern of really bad behavior and i'm not just talking about behavior that we'd go this is politically Mm. bad or politically wrong but stuff which is just morally really wrong there was a blind eye turned to that because that wasn't the story at the time. Everyone knew it. No one wanted to look it up because it wasn't the story. And he was a useful source for the story they wanted to tell. But then when he no longer served that purpose, when he no longer was a useful, you know, labor malcontent, then it's fine. Then it's expedient for everyone to go, oh, this wrong and has been staring us in the face of that all along. Mm. Crazy. I suppose the magic combination, which I don't think exists at the moment in the UK media is being outsiders with enough lawyers. Yeah, that's, it's exactly <laughs> that. You, you've either got insiders with lawyers or outsiders without lawyers. And then that does let a lot of people get away with stuff because it is, I mean, we have very strict libel laws in this country, more strict than they have in the United States. Mm. Um, you know, pe- we, we have libel tourism where people come here to sue people because our libel laws are so strict. And I know that in my journalism, I am very careful about what I say that isn't written in another publication Mm. because I don't want to jeopardize the whole organization by saying something that I think might be true, but I don't, haven't, haven't run past the lawyers. So I think it is one place I'd really like Navarro to go over the next five, 10 years, because we're talking, we're we're lifers here, as you've said, Moya, it is for us to be both outsiders with the lawyers that we need and with the investigative journalists that we need. That's always the thing that stymies is exactly, it's the resources, it's having the resources and resources include the legal backing. And it's something I also talked about in this article I wrote, which is, you know, when a magazine I worked for wanted to cover Tim Westwood and the allegations that have existed against Tim Westwood for at least 30 years, 30 years, former BBC DJ, worked for them for 20 years. Loads of allegations at him in the public sphere to the degree that I heard allegations, which Tim Westwood denies, let me just say that wholesale. Um, But I heard these allegations against him when I was 19 in a social setting, completely unconnected to media. That's how widespread these allegations were. Worth digging into, do you not think? But, you know, no one did. And an organization I worked for wanted to do it a couple of years ago. They didn't have the legal backing. They had to link up with bigger organ, like media organizations. These media organizations faff them around for a year basically saying we'll start this with you we'll do this with you then kept dropping out kept dropping out one day two of them joined together say by the way we've got an investigation on a tv show about this going out one of them was the bbc who employed tim westwood for two decades when the allegation time the allegations are leveled against him said we're going to put this out in 24 hours so not only had they stalled working with us for you know a year and a half when this could be in the public domain when they decided it was the right time for them to put out and they had control of the message they put it out and they completely shut this magazine out of the process. They decided, you know, after two decades, it was time to investigate these allegations. And, you know, after that, the trail's gone cold. You know, a lot of people who would have worked for the BBC at the time when it was most relevant and could have perhaps, if the allegations were proved true, prevented some of those things happening, they'd gone, they'd moved on, they'd left. It was safe to report on. There was a consensus there that it was now just enough distance, I think, that they could get this out in there. And they also, we couldn't do anything because we didn't have the legal backing to report on that story without them. I think it's really interesting. There's a quote here from William Gladstone that I want to read about, read about, read out, which is, the freedom of the repair press was not merely to be permitted and tolerated, but to be highly prized for it tended to bring close together all the national interests and preserve the institutions of the country. A cheap press was imagined to be uh, something that would shore up the social order because the journalists who were working in it were the ones who band together and preserve the institutions. And I think that's exactly what we've seen happen. So can I do my Jerry's final thought? Yeah. Um, I mean, my Jerry's final thought is this, which is media in this country has been designed over a number of decades, if not centuries, to protect the financial and political and social interests of an elite few. Now, there have been times where those interests have been more imperiled. There have been times like now when it feels like those interests are more entrenched than ever. And if we want to take them on, we need everyone going gangbusters in every part of civil society. So that does mean trade unions. That does mean left-wing political parties. That does mean grassroots organizations operating outside of the electoral process. And that also means truthful, independent media which is dedicated to hauling the rich and the powerful over coals, right? That's Mm. what 
we want to do. And I think that if I was to describe our mission statement to my mum, which I often find myself doing when she's like, who do you work for again? Um, I would say that we both want to achieve a political change. We want to change the political status quo in this country. We want to produce a more fair and equitable society. But we also want, we also truly want to unfuck the media. Like we've described all of this dysfunction and we want to change that by calling it out where we see it and also being a model of something better. Mm. And I think that we've done extraordinarily well so far. And the reason why that's happened is because we do have this much more sustainable funding model, which isn't reliant on sponsored content or commercial partnerships or venture capital or billionaire ownership. It's based on the fact that we've got a really committed audience who value quality information, who value perspectives and analyses which aren't found on the mainstream, and who value, I think, pluralism and debate. And everything that we've done so far is because of them. And sometimes it feels ungrateful to say we need more, but we do need more. We always need more because we want to break bigger, better, and more difficult stories. We want to be able to have a legal team on standby that we can run things by. So we can be the first one to break a Westwood story or a Nick Cohen story or a Neil Coyle story or whatever else it is. We want to be the ones who do that kind of original reporting, which can change the face of media and politics in this country. And it ain't cheap, right? But, you know, it ain't called the struggle for nothing. Nothing mm. that's worth having comes easily. And I think a good media is part of that. So thank you to our audience because you have stuck by us while we've been learning and while we've been growing. What we really want from you is one hours of your wage per month or whatever you can afford so we can keep working around the clock to deliver the news and the analysis and the comment that really matters to you. Or in Michael's case, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. <sighs> Thank you for everything you've done for us so far. Thank you for sticking with us. And thank you for watching. This has been Downstream with Moya and Michael. Goodbye. <laughs>